2 through 33, sound 1A through 7 on deck stand by Q Actors. Electrics, kill the blue run lights, please. Like you 2 and sound 1A, go. After about... Lifetime achievement, not a moment too soon. I love being a playwright. The hours are flexible, and you don't have to wear a tie unless you're invited to the Tonys. I've loved it since I wrote my first play. It was about George Gershwin and Ira, his talented lyricist wife. I loved it when I wrote my college varsity show and it made people laugh, only this time on purpose. I even loved it when my first play crashed and burned at the old Royale on West 45th Street, and John Steinbeck told me to get right back on the horse. If you ain't been throwed, you ain't rode. I loved it when my second play was a success and I could quit my job as a magazine editor. I love it when I remember the little boy I was, thrilling to Ethel Merman, <clears throat> shooting out candles while reclining on a motorcycle in any get your gun. I love it when I remember not being able to get out of my seat after a devastating performance of Long Day's Journey Into Night. I love it when my parents, shaken by their experience at death of a salesman, at death of a salesman. It changed their lives. My father quit his job at General Foods and struck out on his own. I love it when I know something I wrote softened the hearts of parents who had banished their son and daughter from their lives when they came out to them as gay and lesbian. I love it when I remember the artists who tried to help us understand the devastation of AIDS, even when they were stricken with it themselves. I love it when I remember theater changes hearts, that secret place where we all truly live. I love my playwright peers, past, present, and especially future. You're chomping at the bit for your turn. Your diversity is long overdue and welcome. It's a club with open admissions. The only dues are your heart, your soul, your mind, your guts, all of you. Your commitment to this ancient art form assures me that what we do matters. The world needs artists more than ever to remind us what kindness, truth, and beauty are. Oh, brave new world that has Shakespeare, that has, leave it to me to screw up Shakespeare. Oh, 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 brave new world that has such people in it. Shakespeare's talking to all of us. No one does it alone, least of all playwrights, most of all this one. Tonight is overwhelming for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello there, and welcome to a, a very special episode of, of Hang and Focus Live. I'm your host, Sean Daniels. I want to go ahead and bring into the room Chanel Bragg, who is always our amazing co-host and associate artistic director of the theater. Hi, hi Chanel. How are you? Hey, I'm great. What, what a moving clip. I just felt transported, um, and it made me miss the Tonys so much and gathering with people and hearing epic speeches like that that linger with you. So for people that don't know, um, that is Terrence McNally delivering the Tony speech for his lifetime achievement, which was his fifth Tony award um, that he received. And so today we're here to talk with his husband, one of my favorite people, Tony and Oliver award winning producers, Tom Curtihy. And um, let's, bring, let's bring Tom out and we can just begin to dive into what it'll be, I think a very special episode for us. Hey Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Tom has already left the show. Oh, he's back. Yeah. Here I am. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Thank you. I uh, I so appreciate you joining us. You know, I 
Uh, I'm such a fan of you. First of all, let's start with you before we talk about Terrence, right? Because everybody loves to talk about Terrence, but I want to talk about you for a moment. Is that I'm such a fan of, of you because not only your success, but um, something I try to emulate, I'm sure you know this, everybody thinks of you as one of the few good guys, one of the people that feels like you can actually produce theater and um, you don't have to be ruthless, you don't have to be cheap. You know, I think because you were married to an artist, it definitely changes the way that you produce. And I think that you have that reputation worldwide of like, oh, you're with Tom. Like, first of all, how did you get with Tom? That's amazing. But second of all, like he always takes care of the people that are around him in an incredibly generous way. That is not the way that I think most commercial producers work. And so that inspires me to try to be a better leader because I know like, oh God, Tom would, Tom would figure out a way, right? to not let you know the small minutia get away from the, the gloriousness of art making that happens. So thank you for that. Thank you, that's um, really nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, you know, we've known each other for um, years now, right? In terms yes, of turning yeah. it. Um, I, so my play, The, the White Chip, uh, a, a mutual person that we both know read a copy of it and sent it <clears> to Tom. Um, as the story goes, Tom did not read it right away because he thought it was a play about computers. That is um, correct. That is correct. <laughs> there, is, there is truth to the myth. <laughs> um, and then eventually you did. And then Tom has been the, the producer that has really shepherded it along all the way, you know, through its multiple productions to its successful off-Broadway commercial run. And then- Good critic. Pick off Broadway a hit. Yeah. That's right. That's right. To be able to do. Um, and I think that's amazing, right? That that a, a commercial producer who is involved in the development of a piece so long and um, not just kind of picking up what's popular and moving it, but something that moves your soul to be able to do, right? And I think that separates you from other producers also. Um, Thank you, Sean. Oh, no, it's very true. So along the way also, in addition to that, you have been married to, as long as I have known you, to Terrence McNally. And when we were, um, right after he passed, you began to post just really beautiful little moments from his life. And I feel like so many of us know Terrence as kind of the titan of the American theater. And um, for those of us that have seen his amazing documentary, I mean, there's amazing things in there to be able to learn. But what I loved about your posts where you, you of course knew him as a human and you knew him yep. as, a, as, a, as a regular person. And um, you, you did this post about how much he liked tulips. And I thought like, oh my God, if ever Tom would do it, I would love Tom just to come on the show and share with us a little bit about the kind of the smaller person that Terrence was and not the five Tony awards and not, you know, all of those. And those things are like, so of course important and we would not have so much without him. And, you know, I think it's always important with Terrence to clock and maybe you can talk about this a little. He was out and he was proud about it at a time that it felt even dangerous to have a career in the theater by admitting that, right? Yeah. And he has he has always believed that the, the artist's first goal is to tell the truth and he has lived that every day of his life. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring you on and if, you know, f any small stories that you have, I would love just for our audience to get to know Terrence better because I do think there's maybe a generation of younger people that don't even realize the real importance he had to our field, right? We get a lot of theater people who watch our show that maybe know him but maybe mm -hmm. don't know him as the person. And so oh. yeah, and you were grateful and you said like, yes, I'd love to come on and I would love to do that. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do my best, Sean. It's, uh, it's still hard uh, to talk about him. Um, you know, Terrence died on March 24th. We were uh, together for 20 years. Um, it was um, just a really happy marriage, I, you know, and there's just no other way to describe that. Um, everybody, uh, when Terrence passed, a lot of people commented that watching us together uh, really inspired them. And when, when you're a couple, you don't, you don't notice uh, that other people are noticing you. And, um, 
One person said to me, watching you two together wanted to make me love more. And that, um, that really moved me and, and um, just comforted me. Um, Terrence was very, 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 very funny. Um, he was a truth teller. He, uh, he, his first play on Broadway was in 1964 and it featured an out gay character who was sexually active and liked sex and was unapologetic about it. Um, and uh, he got savaged for it and it was considered, uh, you know, scandalous and blasphemous and all of those other homophobic things that people used to hurl at us. Um, I think I'm, I'm particularly raw uh, today. His birthday was Tuesday, it was election day. And um, without wanting to get too political, I think that he, he very definitely um, wanted a new administration in the White House. And I um, spent a lot of time in Florida uh, working on getting out the vote in low income communities because I wanted to give him a new president for his birthday. Um, so uh, as we've watched the returns and my goodness, Arizona is very much in the news uh, and, and props to your state because it looks like I think you, you all did the right thing or at least in my mind and in my husband's mind. Um, but I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of rambling, but I, I think one thing that um, I would love next generations to know about Terrence is he really was um, a, a, a generous, generous writer. He, he loved, and I mean loved, going to the theater. And if we could have gone seven nights a week, he would have. And even as his health was deteriorating, he would say, honey, let's go, let's go to a play. And we would go to, um, from Broadway plays to off, 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 off Broadway. He loved writers in particular, um, but we would often go to Rattlestick Theater or theaters out in Brooklyn or, or anywhere, because if he read it about, um, a piece that somehow was interesting, not necessarily got a rave, but sounded like a fresh new voice was um, emerging that excited him. And, and Sean, it's really important to say that he really loved your play. He loved The White Ship. He was so proud that I was producing your play. Um, the When we opened The White Ship Off-Broadway, I was opening three shows, I think within a month of one another. They were The Inheritance, Little Shop of Horrors, and The White Ship. And um, God, was he just so excited that The White Ship was going to be seen by people and get people to be thinking and laughing and maybe healing, um, which were all values that he had. Um, when Terrence died, um, the the people in our building, I'm really proud of this, the, um, from the porter to the, the doorman to the super to every single neighbor, um, people were, were devastated. He treated everyone the same. And um, I had to really comfort a lot of people who worked in the building um, who were just devastated by his loss. As I remain, um, but it also made me really proud that he <clears throat> never, he was the son of a beer distributor and he was the son of a beer distributor. He was not a pretentious guy. He, um, he loved, he could go high and he could go low. We would watch uh, Dumb and Dumber every year for, on Thanksgiving <laughs> and laugh hysterically. And then we would go to the Metropolitan Opera or he would recite Shakespeare, he would be off book on, you know, he thought King Lear was the greatest work of art ever um, across any um, art form. And, um, you know, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He was, he was absolutely brilliant, but also completely unpretentious and um, just my angel, you know.
Yeah, you know, so like one of the like weird things of having you produce a play of yours means that at some point there's like a private reading just to hear what it is. And then you're like, oh, invite some friends. And then, you know, Terrence McNally comes in and sits down and listens to your play also. And um, he was so generous. I mean, that's the thing that was so shocking is that it came up and there, there was a line in the show that I felt like was too cheesy. And so I asked him and he was like, oh, no, I'd keep it. You know, I mean, he was so kind of... Um, and it was a line that ended up, you know, everybody loves in the show. And so, but it was like, all right, you know, if Terrence McNally feels like we should keep it, I think we should keep it to be able to do it. But he was so, yeah, you know, I we all we all know kind of big time people and there's definitely a they're in the room kind of feel to it. And you never had that feeling with him. He was always just the most supportive of other artists. Yeah, he was um, a kid. He was a kid at heart. He just, he just... He couldn't believe his good fortune that we got to play in this space, you know, that we we get to create theater for a living and and what a gift, you know, how how great, how fortunate are we? He was very um, he had a lot of gratitude and he took it deadly seriously. I mean, you knew when Terrence wasn't enjoying something. <laughs> it wasn't much of, there wasn't much of a poker face there. Um, but but that has value, you know, because you really always knew what he felt. Um, and he he uh, he was a deep, deep feeling person. And I just I, I don't really know that I've ever said this out loud, but he was a great husband. Like he was just amazing. He, I just hit the jackpot in the love department, you know. So, how sorry. I don't think I know this. How how did you guys meet? Uh, I um, produced a panel. Uh, I was the chair of a group called the East End Gay Organization on the East End of Long Island, and I produced a panel called Theater from a Gay Perspective with a woman named Isa Goldberg and um, who moderated it. I introduced the panel. We met in the green room in East Hampton um, before this panel and uh, we just connected. He made me laugh, I made him laugh and um, that the rest was history. You know, it all happened very, very quickly. Uh, and we did. had our shared recovery as one of the things that brought us together. Um. Yeah, I always feel like I have a good recovery story. And then Terrence told me his, right? Yeah, which he is wins. that You know, he that, wins. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, for, and for people that don't know, Angela Lansbury told him to pull his shit together. Yeah, at Stephen Sondheim's birthday party. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, yeah. Angela Lansbury pulled him aside and said, you know, you're so brilliant, you're so gifted and you're, you're throwing your life away. You need to stop drinking. and. You know, how do you top that? Uh, <laughs> and it's so apparent. It's just like, okay, yeah. Uh, well, and we all, you know, everybody that gets sober fears that whatever is makes them creative will be gone, right, right once they stop using. And, right. and so Terrence got sober. And what is the first show that he wrote after he got sober? Frankie and Johnny. That's uh, right. So one of like the, the great shows, you know, Tony nominated at this moment in terms right. of a revival. Yeah, with right. Roger McDonald and Michael Shannon, directed by the great Aaron Arbus. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful production. Yeah. So. Wait, so, so walk us through this again. So you meet in the green room. You're, um, you hit it off. You're both funny. You're both sober. Like what, you date for a while? Like how, what's the story? How do we get? He was leave, he, uh, look, I, I was uh, a poverty lawyer. I was working providing free legal services to low-income people living with HIV and AIDS and really happy. And I had given up on men. I was just like, I don't, I, I'm sick of <laughs> men. Uh, and I was perfectly content with that. Um, and as he was leaving, he said, listen, I'm going to Machu Picchu for two months. Who says that? Uh, yes. <laughs> but I'd love to call you when I get back. And I thought, whatever, fine, that's lovely. And I said, I don't know, like, you know, Terrence McNally said he's gonna call me, but I did not think it was flirty or anything. And it was six weeks later to the day that he sent me an email and said, I'm back, would you like to have dinner? Uh, and I, I um, 
in my office, I called everyone into the office and said, read this email. Is that a date or is that? <laughs> and everyone said, that's a date. And I was like, man, yeah, we're just, you know, but um, it, it was a date. Uh, and that was July 29th of 2001, our first date. And we've been together, we were together ever since, literally uh, just, it happened very, very fast. Um, and he got diagnosed with lung cancer later that year um, and uh, said, you know, this may be too much for you. You, you, you may want to um, go on with your life. I, it, it's, it, we're only a few months together and I don't, I don't want to put you in an unfair position. And I said, if you're telling me to go away, I understand, but I'd like to stay if, if you want me around. And he said, I'd like that very much. And so a lot of our early um, courtship, strangely, was in Memorial Sloan Kettering, Ho Kettering Hospital, where he was recovering from lung surgery. And we, you learn a lot about a person under duress. Uh, he learned a lot about me. I learned a lot about him. And we just fell more deeply in love. So what's a, you know, at the, at the height of your relationship, what was a day like with him? What you guys drank coffee together in the morning? Like what's the, I want to know like the, <laughs> what's so funny is it's so mundane. I mean, we, we really, we love, we, we would joke, you know, we're probably two of the most boring people you'll ever meet. Uh, we, we did get up and have coffee together and um, we, we both were both talkers, you know, <laughs> Just we started a conversation that never ended. I mean, we, we <laughs> both like news junkies, so we would read the Times together, watch um, uh, CNN together. We had uh, crushes on different CNN anchors, and we used to joke that we're going to create an uh, the men of CNN uh, calendar uh, as a benefit. But, but, you know, you know uh, Terrence wrote, uh, I would work. Um, we, he very often wrote in another room and I was, we liked being together. And, and again, you know, when someone gets so sick so early in a relationship, you do your best not to take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. So we try to structure our lives in a way that we could be together as much of the time as possible. And we were pretty successful at, uh, at doing that. I mean, I, I was a lawyer when we met and, and um, early in our relationship, I had never, I certainly had ever dated someone who was famous or um, in the theater or older than I was. And I, uh, I was very determined not to become, um, uh, Mrs. McNally or the, you know, the, uh, that guy with Terrence. Uh, and so I said, I'm not giving up my career. I'm not giving up my identity. And he, he looked at me like, did I ask you? <laughs> like, I would <laughs> never even think of that. Um, and so I was in court almost every day for the first few years. And, and as he was sick, I was coming back from work, taking, like going to the hospital, taking care of him. Then as he got better, we would, and all these famous people were coming into the hospital room. So uh, again, early in our relationship, it was like, oh, there's Cheetah Rivera, there's Nathan Lane, there's Angela, there, you know, it was nuts. Um, but I was embraced by his friends immediately. And I um, fell in love with these people who loved him so much. And uh, it just, it, it our, really, it, there was never a difficult, point in our relationship. We did, what did happen is that we be, both became uh, really determined to get married because um, for him, protecting me became um, something that really meant a lot to him. Yeah. Uh, and so we started, we got very, very involved with the marriage equality movement. And um, in 2003, the most married you could be in this country was to get a civil union in the state of Vermont, which created a spousal relationship. So um, you could go to Canada, but we, we didn't want to do that. So we became, we, we got 
married, what we called married uh, in Vermont in December of 2003. And then we've been married and married and married uh, a number of times. But just to, to go back to it, the thing that the, one of the joys of being with Terrence is I always knew when the writing was going well, because all of a sudden um, the music, he played music while he wrote, the music would get louder and louder. And it was very often, unsurprisingly, Maria Callas or, or opera. And I, you know, there was the tap of the keys was very sexy to me. I thought, wow, that's really hot that he's in there writing. Uh, <laughs> but then as the music would blare, there was something so, so beautiful about knowing that um, with the volume, with the increased volume, um, came more words and came sort of characters were being born and a new work was being birthed in the next room. Um, and um, that was that was really pretty cool. Uh, and we we were always held hands. We laughed a lot. We were really really silly, um, but also it, Terrence um, was so naturally curious that I feel like one of the gifts he gave me was an appreciation for beauty that I hadn't necessarily had before. I always I was always a social justice warrior um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, uh, but I didn't always uh, take the time to um, nurture my soul in a way um, that I think has really helped me broaden my horizons and appreciate the, the sort of necessity of art. Can I, I wanna read something you wrote and it, it, it may be too much, but you wrote this and I think it's one of the more gorgeous things I've ever seen someone write about someone they love. Um, so you said, Terrence taught me to pay attention to delight in beauty, to think harder and longer and claim my rightful place in the world, to love unconditionally, to laugh as often as possible, but to take life and death and art and politics deadly seriously. Mm -hmm. He taught me how to trust my taste and my instincts. He taught me that I had gifts to offer the world and they were not to be squandered. But perhaps most of all, he taught me to relish the silence. Within our noisy, busy lives, we found comfort in the quiet. Being together meant the world to us, and we ensured we were together as much of the time as possible. I, I find that to be such a, we would all dream that anybody would write that about us at some given point in our lives. It's truly um, stunning. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, you know, um, it's all true. Uh, it's funny, I don't even, I didn't, I, I wrote that, I didn't think about it, it poured out of me. Um, and I'm, uh, yeah, uh, I think, um, I think it's good to be reminded um, uh, to find um, comfort and inspiration in the quiet moments in our lives. Um, and, um, I pulled, you know, I, I've been, I was thinking about this interview, Sean, and I was thinking about you and I was thinking about the way that we were connected, which, which uh, felt almost spiritual. Um, and again, how much Terrence loved your play and, and really was a great champion of the white ship and, and, um, wouldn't let me off the hook. Uh, not that I wanted to be. I mean, he just kept saying, like, what's going on with the white chip? What's going on with the white chip? He really, he really believed in the play. And and there's, in thinking about this election and his birthday and, and what we do, um, you know, the last monologue of Masterclass, um, there are two lines in it that I love, and I, I pulled it up before this, and it said, the world can and will go on without us but I have to think that we have made this world a better place, that we have left it richer, wiser than had we not chosen the way of art. Um, and I, you know, I just keep getting drawn to that monologue and I keep um, reading it and uh, thanking him for 
uh, encouraging me to choose the way of art um, because I'm, I'm, I'm really a fortunate guy. I've had two careers. I mean, I, I was an attorney and now I'm a recovering lawyer and I'm a producer and I, I get to tell stories for a living. And I will say, um, shame on me if I don't seize this time um, to honor him and uh, continue to tell stories that um, demand to be heard and that move audiences and challenge audiences and maybe advance our world. Uh, I, you know, we're all living through this pandemic and Terrence um, through his work, Love Valor and Lips Together, Teeth Apart and um, even the Lisbon Traviata um, and some men, uh, but Love Valor most especially uh, really was um, a lesson in uh, community and um, in how we should behave in the face of a health crisis and the importance of community and um, nurturing one another. And, and um, I've been reading a lot of uh, James Baldwin lately and, and his writing, uh, I feel like Terence was influenced, I, I know definitively that his writing was influenced by Baldwin it, it, because I feel like the themes of love and rage are, um, swirling through my mind and my soul and and this time in our history um I, I hope i always say love wins as as you know but i feel like um rage is 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 the engine um and and i i i'm i'm okay with that because i'm angry i'm hurt i miss him i know terence was very sick so so he had a lot of comorbidities. I don't blame his death on anyone or, or even or on the government. But I do think I look around at the, the way that we have, that this administration has mishandled this pandemic and the indifference to human life and the way that families are separated from their loved ones at the time of their loss. And I think, I think it's um, a, a, a a tragedy. I think it's um, inexcusable. And I think that we're going to have to heal ourselves. And, um, and I, I do think that the arts are going to be a way forward. And I think that telling stories in shared space, which is what theater artists do, will be a, um, an essential means of healing. And I want to be on the front lines in doing so. Absolutely. That is our responsibility, though as art makers is to reflect what is going on in the world today and what is really affecting our communities and displaying that on stage because that's what empathy looks like. Um, right. As you were talking, I was laughing to myself because I used to be a speech and debate nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and I performed dual and terp and I did uh -huh. my class. Oh, really? I did. I did. I played the student and my friend um, Margali played, of course, Samira Callas' character. And it was just now that I was like, oh my God, that was Terrence. Yeah. How, how influenced I've been by his work through years without even realizing it until this moment right now. And so thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. being here. And also thank you for your work. And I'm an activist in town as well. And so cool. your social justice work, how you've worked for the underrepresented, that's valuable and valid. And I would love to just hear a little bit about how you feel about the current state of marriage equality right now. Like what work do you think that we have yet to do? Um, because I wanna be next to you. Um, <laughs> oh, let's do it. Um, uh, you know, I, I Sean, I don't want to get you in trouble. Um, and um, I, um, we all watched George Floyd get murdered. Um, 
eight minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, uh, and um, I think, uh, I think um, him calling for his mother at the end of his life uh, is um, him calling to all of us um, to put, to make sure that if, if he couldn't breathe, that we breathe life into his um, legacy and we make sure that um, Black lives do matter and that we undo systemic racism and that we commit to being anti-racist. Um, I think that we have a moral responsibility to do so. Um, when I was doing HIV work, I, I was um, in the Bronx for a decade providing free legal services uh, to people with HIV in, in the Bronx. And 99% um, of my clients were people of color and these challenges are not new. Um, but um, what is different, I believe, is that we were all, the, the nation was under lockdown and in an age of social media, we saw the image of his murder and we lived it and relived it and people were galvanized and um, angered and um, we couldn't escape the image of his torture, um, which uh, it, um, makes it incumbent upon us to do something about it. And we had, we had, because I do believe he's out of here, we had a president who refused to condemn white supremacy, um, who has intimated after Charlottesville that there are good people on both sides of these issues and that is fundamentally untrue. We, um, racism is a moral crime and we have an obligation to um, call people on their racism um, and by and um, and to answer your question also and homophobia as well I um, since you asked about um, marriage equality I'll say on the day that um, Donald Trump uh, said that uh, COVID should not um, I believe the phrase was dominate people's lives uh, I, along with the families of people who died from COVID, um, were deeply, deeply, deeply pained by that kind of indifference, <clears throat> indifference and insensitivity. And I, uh, I heard from so many people about what, just how cruel that felt. And on that same day, um, Justices Alito and Thomas in a, um, a, a decision um, indicated that the Obergefell decision um, that granted federal marriage equality might, um, could reasonably be overturned and was suspect. And I just thought, how dare you assault my family? How dare you assault um, the dignity of families who have lost their loved ones? And I, um, I am really excited that I think tonight we know that we have a new president. Um, and I think that uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be supportive of the arts rather than dismissing them as non-essential to this culture. And I think that um, we have an opportunity, we have an obligation to take this trauma and um, turn it into an opportunity for not only healing, but advancing the human condition and really, really, really making systemic change because um, there is so much pain out there. And that man and this administration has stoked the flames of hate and it is unacceptable. Um, it is unacceptable, and we just we have we are so much better than that. I love your your thinking about 
what do we do after this, right? Like, how do we take this moment? And if we know we have to heal and we know that art is gonna play a crucial role in that, how do we make that happen, right? Like, what are the pieces? How are the ways we connect? Who are the audiences we invite in? What's the work that we feel like is important? As opposed to just saying like, it's over, like, great. Right, yeah, you know? yeah. no, no, not, it's so not over. It's that's like- That's right, that's right. We're at the beginning, you know, and I, I think of, I, I think a lot about John Lewis. I mean, I, I look to Stacey Abrams and she is a total goddess to me. And I know I'm talking <laughs> a lot about politics, but I will say that I think, um, I, 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 I wanna, I do wanna say, we have to remember to entertain as, 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 um, as theater practitioners, but that doesn't, entertaining is, has a very broad definition. It, it, I, I'm, when I squirm in the theater, I feel like I'm entertained in a way that challenges me. Um, I, I do think that it's, it feels hokey in the context of, of um, what we're talking about, but I do fundamentally believe that love wins. And I think we have to lead with love. And, and I think that um, without joy and without a sort of uh, deep love of form, of craft, of one another, of um, possibility, uh, we're not gonna get anywhere. Um, and that doesn't mean um, not being deeply principled in our actions and um, allowing ourselves anger and um, really demanding change. Uh, so it's not just Hallmark cards, but it is, it is infusing every choice we make with, with, with deep, deep, deep love for our fellow humans, because I think that's radical. Absolutely. We, we have a, a video I would love to show um, which is about you and Terrence getting married. And then it's a little bit of an interview that the two of you did, because then I would love to come and talk back because I feel like Terrence's work has always been political, right? Even, and, and maybe he's the most subversive in that way that you maybe you don't even realize that his work has always been political, but he has been fighting, right, for gay rights and for marriage equality all of his life. I mean, it, I think it's sometimes hard for our younger viewers to realize there was a time when he was he was out and other people that you know of that time were not because they thought that will end your playwriting career and so and he was unafraid right he never he was never really in the no closet. nobody else was when he was i mean or yeah. very few uh but yeah yeah no. um, and he made it he was very subversive because he's so funny um, that's right that's right yeah yeah so um, if everybody would turn off their cameras and their mute, we're gonna show this brief video about you and Terrence getting married, and then we'll be right back. We're gathered here today to witness the reaffirming of marriage vows of Terrence McNally and Thomas Terrence. If there is anyone present today who knows of any reason why this couple should not reaffirm their vows, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. Excellent. To you, to you, Terry, solemnly re-declare that you take Thomas to be your spouse. Do you promise to continue to love, honor, cherish, and keep him for as long as you both shall live? To you, Thomas, solemnly re-declare that you take Terrence to be your spouse. Do you promise to continue to love, honor, cherish, and keep him for as long as you both shall live? And as much as you have consented to be reunited in the bonds of matrimony, and you have re-exchanged your wedding vows before all those present today, therefore by the powers vested in me, by the state of New York, I re-pronounce you married, and you may seal your vows with a kiss. <laughs> When I met Tom, marriage wasn't even a part. There was no gay marriage movement. I could write about it in plays, men getting married, but I didn't think it would be a reality. We heard about this great inn in Vermont and said, let's just treat ourselves with a civil union. I don't think either of us fully knew how perfect that moment would be. I am there for you for the rest of my life. 
It's a very profound pledge to make to another person. And it makes me feel safer, more protected, happier, calmer. I'm, I'm not alone in the world. As much as I love Tom, I never had that feeling until we stood in Vermont in that inn and said the words to each other. Oh, okay. yeah. Go ahead and come on back in. Oh, uh, so. I turned you... it up so my boyfriend could hear it back there for about <laughs> yeah, yeah. five years. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> So, so can you just tell us a little bit that that's your, that's the video of you getting married again, right? Or yeah. for the, the first time, I mean, tell us about that day, right? This is the day. Uh, that day with the mayor, that, that, that was marriage number three. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was the day after federal marriage equality was granted. Yeah. Um, we had been married in, as I told you earlier, in Vermont. And then um, in 2010, the Kennedy Center did a festival of Terrence's plays, uh, including Masterclass. Uh, and um, they passed marriage equality. That city passed marriage equality while we were there. And we said, you know, let's do this. This is, this is <laughs> so we got married then. Uh, and New York hadn't, there was no marriage in New York at that time. It was, it was nuts. Uh, and now, uh, and then I think that was 2016. That was uh, when the Obergefell decision came out and, uh, and we both said, let's renew our vows. Let's do this again. Uh, and and got in touch with the mayor and um, and so that was on the steps of City Hall on a really 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 happy day in this country. I think the the de the decision came out and I remember like texting you like oh my god this is amazing and then you were like I'm getting married tomorrow <laughs> I was like what are you what are you talking about <laughs> what is what could you possibly and then and then like. And then the next day we all saw like oh you and Terrence got the mayor to do you know because you were like we are. We are not going to miss this moment to really, right. you know, the best yeah. thing we can do is get out there and also just show like an incredibly healthy, long term, loving relationship as part of what this is. Yeah, on lots of levels, you know, and it was uh, it was fun. <laughs> it was really, uh, Terrence's brother, uh, who is from Texas, he and his wife were in town and we all went down and it was just great. It was great. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. What are the what are the things about that only you know? Maybe the rest of us don't. He loved art, right? He loved. Oh, wow, did he love art? Yeah, visual art, right? Paintings. He loved to collect paintings, right? Yeah. Um, he he. he uh, you know, it, I, I, one thing that I, I enjoy sharing with people and about his process, I knew when he was. He didn't write every day. Um, he was not uh, disciplined that way. Although what he used to say, the house could be on fire and if I'm writing, I can keep going. Like, you know, once he was going, it just he and he loved to write. Um, but I knew when something was cooking in his mind and when he was getting ready to write because he he would start like, alphabetizing the spice rack or, uh, you know, like the CDs would need like an, a total uh, recatalog. I mean, just crazy, you know, he had to put something in order in order to be able to write. And it was, um, it amused the hell out of me and it annoyed him that I found it amusing because he would really be <laughs> like, oh, you know, this bookshelf really, we, we have to rethink the way we categorize the books. We should do this by all. I don't know, by subject matter rather than author. I'm like, all right, honey, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, it was just sort of fun to watch that, that process. And then the words would just pour out of him, really, really pour out of him. Now, is that the type of thing that he knew that was his process or only you knew that was his process from watching? He did not know. I, he did I, not know. Yeah. That, so he just thought, he really had a great idea about spices. And then next thing you knew, there was a new play. Right. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'd be, I'd be, I, I would do the, I would make this, um, I would make this circular motion. Like the plane is coming in for a landing. You know, I, I know what this means. 
um, but he was completely un unaware. <laughs> um, he loved uh, well, some in, some stuff. You know, the the one of the most painful parts about um, him passing is that we haven't been able to celebrate his life right. um, because of social distancing and because of COVID. Uh, and I I will only do a celebration of his life when we can congregate in a theater. I just, um, uh, that's too important to me and too reflective of who he was. So, so it's been, it, that's been really challenging at times because part of me just feels guilty, but also there's no, I, I now understand that the importance of ritual more than I did um, before this because there was no closure whatsoever. You know, it was two months before I hugged my mother um, because we didn't know what this thing was. And I, I had to quarantine and then I uh, couldn't get a test because I didn't have, I mean, it was nuts. Um, and so I can't wait to be able to really celebrate his life and be in a room, be in a, a Broadway house uh, with all the people who loved him so much and tell stories and listen to music. And, and he gave me a lot, he told, he was very clear about some of the things that he wanted and I can't wait to share some of those stories. But, um, but he loved a fresh orange juice in the morning. Uh, and I, wherever we were in the world, I would go out and find it for him. That was our little thing. Um, and we had Wait, a, even, even if you're somewhere else, you would get up and you would, would leave the I hotel. It would be like my mission. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he really did like silly things. Like, you know, he, he loved dogs and he loved, um, you know, when he was really sick uh, initially during the first lung surgery, when he was in the hospital, we would watch... Um, the dumbest thing, uh, Friday night, uh, what are the, the America's Funniest Home Videos? Right. But we would, without the sound. So like, you know, pratfalls and silly, just really stupid things would make us laugh a lot. Um, and we loved, loved, loved to laugh together. Um, and you still have coffee in the morning with him? I do not the way that I did um, when he passed because I was in Florida and I would watch the sun rise and have coffee with him um, for for the first few months because I was I'm back here in Florida um, and it was really, really uh, spiritual and beautiful for me to watch the sun rise and just share these uh, reflections with him. Um, so I do that a bit less, but I do. I have my rituals around um, being with him. And, uh, you know, he would want me to be active and not to, I'm in a lot of pain as evidence, but I cried on this call, but, I, <laughs> but I'm also in touch with joy. And, um, and I, I have so much, this is as a program person, Sean, you'll understand this. What I really have is gratitude. I have so much gratitude. I mean, lucky, lucky me. I opened up, um, give me one second. I opened up his um, book. Uh, he has got a memoir in plays. Um, and to be honest with you, I had forgotten he dedicated this to me. And I just, I opened it up and I saw it from my husband, Tom Curdy. And I just, I thought, oh my God, I'm the luckiest guy alive. Like, uh, lucky me you know and so over the weekend um i'm i keep going back to his plays and i keep thinking about the this time in our history where we're all so separated from one another but i think very connected i mean i think you know i i think this this election actually has an opportunity to really bring people together too if we do it right you know yeah, you know, I, I think the thing I always think about Terrence, like it's it's very sweet that he liked my play. Um, and it's, you know, as as you know, of course, like on the day that we uh, had first preview, he was in the hospital, right? And so he sent a picture with you of him holding the play for, for him to know. And like, that's all very sweet. But I think like 
It's a five-time Tony Award winner who's yeah. like reaching out to me to say like, have a good first preview. Like what, what type of field would we look like if everybody, regardless of success, had that level of like, hey, I know it's your first preview, it's gonna go great. Like who is the, you know, if, you know, who is that distance from me that I showed that level of care for, right? That Terrence did because he could have easily had said nothing and nobody would ever have thought twice. Because of I course he is. That really is that that is who he was. Like it wasn't it wasn't a sh it wasn't for show. It was these private moments. And so many writers and actors and directors have said like, you may not know this, but Terrence did X for me or Terrence yeah. did Y for me. And that just it was in his DNA. It was just part of who he was. And and I remember having to taking that picture of uh, he was so sick in that hospital. And he was so determined to make sure that you knew that he was there with you in spirit and that he was just, I, and he, and excuse my language, but he was like, get the fuck out of this hospital room and get to your first preview. You have, <laughs> you have work to do. Uh, and, and that's amazing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we and anybody would have said like, oh, you're sick, you're in the hospital, you're famous, any of these reasons, you don't have yeah. to care about other people. And that was just not who he was, right? But like he, he loved it. I, he, he truly loved the theater. He just, he just loved it. And he loved writers and, 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 you know, what he really loved and to say, you know, for you folks at Arizona Theater Company, I think Terrence um, in many ways thought that the work in the regions was even more important than the work in New York because, um, uh, in New York, it's pretty easy to, that, that's not fair, um, but we can take theater for granted, but where people don't have access to stories and where there is just less um, opportunities for, uh, to experience the live arts, he understood that value intrinsically and wherever we went, we went to the theater and um, and I, I think some of our most precious and special memories have been when we just, there was a theater in South Carolina, we just sort of were walking on the streets of um, Charleston once and he saw this little theater and he said, we have to go there. And, and I've remained friendly with these these guys who ran this theater they you know they sold us tickets and then they looked at the credit card and they were like oh my god Terrence. <laughs> <laughs> uh and the same with um you know we 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 saw there was a production of his play mothers and sons in north carolina uh and uh, actually one of the actors sent us a letter and we happened to be driving from new york to florida at the time and so we said you know we're gonna go we're gonna and it was Right. And we spent so much time with these people. And, and um, so I, you know, just, I really salute you all um, because um, what we do matters. It's like Maria says in masterclass, what we do matters. Oh. I love all of this. This has been such a joy. Thank you. Um, we actually grab a word every broadcast from our guests a word that defines where you are right now or a word you would like to leave with us? What would Hopeful. that word be? Hopeful. Hopeful. And why? Because I think, I think that our long national nightmare is over. I think, um, I think we have our first African-American uh, vice president, uh, 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 African-American woman. Uh, I think uh, Joe Biden is um, really believes that uh, in healing. I think he understands loss, and I think he's a kind person. And I think those values are going to be back in the White House. Um, and I was not hopeful a few days ago. I was despondent because it still bothers me that more than um, nearly half the population voted for Donald Trump. Um, because I, I think he has stoked the flames of races that well, you know we don't want to we don't need to say that again. Um, but I'm really hopeful, and I also um, wherever 
I go, I keep hearing, I, or rec in the last few days in particular, uh, it, because it was Terrence's birthday on Tuesday, I've heard from so many more people saying, I can't wait to say his words out loud because it's never been more important. And um, Brian Stokes Mitchell um, sang Make Them Hear You uh, from Ragtime and, and filmed it and encouraged people to share it with their communities to, gal to get people to get out and vote. And uh, so uh, I, I have a lot of hope. Um, and, and I think that we're gonna be on the front lines of, of helping people connect with one another. That's a word I haven't used today. And, and Terrence was all about human connection, including those people that we have a lot of anger at right now, because um, we have to open their eyes to what they supported these last four years, which is unconscionable to me. Well, it's been amazing, Tom, to have you here. It is so, it's so amazing to hear, to be reminded of like what we do matters and that it's so, you know, I don't know, I feel so inspired and full after, after talking with you. So thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing it. And thank you for sharing all these moments with about mm -hmm. Terrence, you know. I will now forever think of orange juice in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for loving him. You know, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Um, all this right, we are, I'm sorry, go ahead. This was a, a, a real a real pleasure for me. It was oh. hard, but it was comforting. The pleasure was ours. Trust. Thank you. All right, we are going to, thank you so much, Tom. And we are gonna yeah. toss it to our call board for next week. Thank you all so much for being with us and we will see you next week. Have a good night, everyone. This is your call board for November 6th through 12th. I'm Will Rogers, Community Engagement Manager at Arizona Theater Company. And this is your place for the latest news and information from the State Theater of Arizona, ATC, Arizona Theater Company. Our digital play reading of York Walker's Covenant has been postponed, but it will be rescheduled. York was, however, able to join the ATC teens on Halloween for a special workshop on writing plays in the genre of horror. And it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, York, for doing that. And thank you, ATC, ATC teens, for participating. Now, speaking of ATC teens, the education station will not be open today. The Department of Learning and Education is taking a well-deserved breath, but they'll be back next week with a whole host of things for you to get involved with here at Arizona Theater Company. And next up in ATC's digital play reading series will be Idris Goodwin's The Realness, November 18th through the 22nd. So join us next week or check back online for information on that. But first, let's find out what other stuff you should not miss around the state of Arizona. Let's head on over to the Ghost Light Beat China. Take it away. Thank you so much, Will. We've got a number of shows opening this weekend. In Tucson, we've got the Rogue Theater opening Mary Shelley's Frankenstein running from November 5th through November 22nd. You can check that out in person or online. Just visit therogetheater.org. And Ballet Tucson begins a series of pop-up performances. These are socially distant events. The first is going to be November 7th at the Tucson Botanical Gardens, uh, followed by a November 15th pop-up at the Tucson Museum of Art. And then there are others in December. Check out balletucson.org to learn more about those. In Phoenix, we have got Southwest Shakespeare Company opening Becoming a Fellow, A Black Girl's Journey. This is one weekend only online, as well as some limited in-person tickets available. That is November 5th through 8th. Visit swshakespeare.org for more information on that. And Mesa Encore Theater presents Club Met Zoom plays. This is going to be their new works festival that they've moved online for 2020, and it will run November 6th through 17th. And you can find more information there at mesaencoretheater.com. And back to you, Will. China, thank you so much for pulling that all together for us. That was awesome. I have, I moved here about a year ago, a little over a year ago, actually now, and uh, I have still yet to see the ballet. So I'm going to go check that out because I love dance. So I encourage you to find something on the call board that you, uh, sounds interesting and go support those theaters and definitely support our theaters, especially right now when you can uh, do so by having your uh, impact doubled. We have a matching uh, gift campaign going on. Find out more about that at Arizona theater dot org slash give, or you can find out more about that from our very own Paula Taylor. Paula Taylor, what do you have for us in the giving corner? Hi everybody, it's Paula Taylor. 
your Chief Development Officer at Arizona Theater Company. Today, I wanted to just share a little bit about why I love the job. Because development really is so much more than just asking people for money. I mean, that's a big part of it. <laughs> but it's about forming relationships, connecting with people, getting to know people and chatting with them. My favorite part of this job is going to lunch with some donors or going over to someone's home, actually not even to talk about Arizona Theater Company, but to talk about their life, our world that we're living in and just day-to-day -day stuff. It's been the hardest thing, not being at the theater together and, and sharing a friendship with each of you or many of you, I should say. But I want you to know I'm here, not just to bug you for money, uh, but to share with you the exciting news about Arizona Theater Company and to also be here if you have any questions or concerns. As the months move on in this position for me, I hope to get to know more and more of you personally. But I also want you to know I'm here if you want to reach out to me. And today I'd also like to thank Ralph L. Smith Foundation and uh, my dear friend Elizabeth Smith for their kind donation to Arizona Theater Company. This is the first time that we've received uh, funding from uh, their family foundation. And it's certainly the most crucial time. So we can't thank you enough. And I'll see you all next week. Take care. Well, that's all we have for you today on the call board. But a few announcements before we go. Don't forget, we will be streaming Idris Goodwin's The Realness, November 18th to the 22nd. And that's part of our digital play reading series. And Adris Goodwin will join us next week on Hang In Focus to talk about the realness. Also next week, we'll be joined by our Chief Development Officer, Paula Taylor, direct from The Giving Corner. She'll be here to talk about our fundraising efforts right now and what's going on at the theater generally. Uh, we're excited to get to know her a little bit better and more about the realness, so please join us for that. The deadline for submissions to the National Latinx Playwriting Award have been extended through December 1st, so get those in if you can. And if you can give, please head on over to arizonatheater.org slash give and give whatever you can, small or large, but right now it will be matched uh, up to $250,000. So please check that out. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thanks to all who voted and see.